here. Here's the latest on the situation in Israel and Gaza. The United Nations reports that nearly 333,000 Palestinians have lost their homes since the bombings in Gaza began. A spokesperson for Hamas tells CNN this morning that it is way too early to begin negotiating the release of Israeli hostages, which could be as many as 150, including grandmothers and infants. Hamas denies that beheaded Israeli women and children are committed acts of rape. Early Thursday morning, Israeli airstrikes killed 50 and injured 281 inside Gaza. That's according to Palestinian officials. The Red Cross is now warning that hospitals in Gaza are turning into morgues. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared every member of Hamas is, quote, a dead man. More than 300,000 Israeli reservists are amassing along the Gaza border in anticipation of Israel launching a ground assault. I'll have more later in this episode. Some happy news. Trump's fraud trial now enters its second week. We learned on Wednesday that Donald Trump wanted to buy the Buffalo Bills for $1 billion in 200, uh, 2014. Deutsche Bank, his primary lender, refused to loan him the money. According to testimony from a former Deutsche Bank executive, Nicholas High, Trump only had $300 million in cash at the time. Trump was told by Deutsche Bank they wouldn't lend him any more money unless he could keep his real estate portfolio above $2.5 billion. But when he took out loans to purchase the Doral Hotel in Miami, Florida, according to new findings from New York State Attorney General Letitia James, Trump's net worth had dipped to below $1.5 billion, breaking his agreement with Deutsche Bank. In Washington, D.C., Trump discovered that his grip over Republicans in the House was not as tight as he thought. If you remember, after January 6, 130 Republicans in the House voted not to certify the presidential election for Joe Biden, including former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, as well as Wednesday's candidates for Speaker Steve Scalise, who describes himself as KK leader, KKK leader David Duke without the baggage, and Jim Jordan, who I describe as David Duke with the baggage. Trump was hoping to play kingmaker after turning down an offer from Marjorie Taylor Greene and Congressman Troy Nels to run for Speaker. He then endorsed Jim Jordan, who, if you remember, fought tirelessly for Trump during his presidency. Jordan spoke to Trump several times on January 6, before and after the insurrection, but has refused to answer a subpoena from the January 6 committee to tell anyone what they talked about. Alas, Wednesday didn't turn out the way Trump wanted. He lost the role of kingmaker in the House. In a closed-door meeting Wednesday morning, Republican members of the House voted to nominate Steve Scalise for Speaker over Trump's pick, Jim Jordan. But lacking 217 votes, the Republicans decided not to take it before the full House for a final vote. The vote tally was Jim Jordan got 99 votes, while Scalise got 113. That adds up to 212, still five short. I'll have more on that in a second. To make matters worse and more perilous, while walking out of the meeting, Jim Jordan, who lost by 18 votes, at first refused to signal whether he would urge his supporters to vote for Scalise. Later in the day, Jordan offered to deliver the nominating speech for Scalise on the floor. Because Jordan was Donald Trump's choice, the vote for Scalise now suggests that Donald Trump's uh, ability to keep uh, the Republicans in, in his thrall, uh, it didn't pan out as some had hoped. 
Trump, as I said, didn't play the role of kingmaker, which will be another in a long list of humiliations for the orange-faced wannabe strongman. Congressman Ken Buck is a Republican from Colorado. After Wednesday's secret ballot, he told the press that he voted present. He didn't vote for Scalise. He didn't vote for Jordan. He voted present, insisting his support is contingent on a candidate willing to say Donald Trump lost in 2020. Buck, along with Chip Roy, are the only members of the far-right Freedom Caucus who voted to certify the 2020 election for Joe Biden. Buck was concerned when, during Tuesday's candidate forum, Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan both refused to admit that Donald Trump was defeated in 2020. As chairman of the House Judiciary Com- Committee, Jim Jordan has been Trump's pit bull and lapdog, attacking local prosecutors in Manhattan and Fulton County for bringing criminal charges against his Fuhrer. Jordan wrote a letter to Fulton County District Attorney Fawny Willis demanding to know why she launched a RICO prosecution against Trump and demanded to know if she was relying on federal funds to take him to trial. Willis wrote back on Wednesday, warning Jim Jordan to butt out. She added that she was worried that Jim Jordan, who never passed the bar exam, might be, quote, ignorant of the United States Constitution. Although Wednesday morning's balloting was secret, Ken Buck said three Republicans voted present, while eight voted for candidates other than Jim Jordan or Steve Scalise. Later in the day, Ken Buck said he did not seem to think the Republicans would be coming together to pick a speaker anytime soon. Texas Republican Congressman Troy Nels, who, along with Marjorie Taylor Greene, was prepared to nominate Trump before Trump decided to endorse Jordan, Troy Nels walked out of the morning vote disappointed that Jim Jordan didn't have the majority and warned This is Donald Trump's party. Congressman Nell said every decision Republicans in the House make should be about guaranteeing that Donald Trump looks good so he can be reelected in 2024. Nell's partner in grime, Marjorie Taylor Greene, said she didn't vote for Scalise because he's suffering from blood cancer. Leave it to Marjorie to keep it classy. Again, Nels was skeptical that Scalise could ever get 217 votes, pushing back against centrists in the Republican caucus who defied Trump's endorsement of Jim Jordan. Nels told reporters, quote, get over yourself because Donald Trump is the leader of our party. Make no mistake. Matt Gates, congressman from Florida, Republican who single-handedly led the fight to remove McCarthy said, long live Speaker Scalise and vowed to vote for him, expressing doubt he would make it on the first round. Max Miller worked in the Trump White House and then got elected to represent Ohio's 7th Congressional District in 2022 with a huge MAGA endorsement from his old boss. Miller has a history of legal problems. Stephanie Grisham, who worked as Trump's White House spokesperson, dated Miller while they both worked in the Oval Office. Grisham later accused Miller of being physically abusive with her. Miller immediately sued her for defamation, but then in August of this year dropped the case. Walking out of the Wednesday morning vote, Miller said he was disappointed that Trump's pick, Jim Jordan, lost to Scalise, adding there was no way he would ever vote for Steve Scalise if and when they take it upstairs for a vote on the floor, which, of course, they decided against on Wednesday. If you remember, we were told we may have a speaker by the end of Wednesday, but even though Scalise won the majority... There's no way right now he can get 218 votes on the floor. Nancy Mace, who disappointed moderate Republicans last week when she voted to fire Kevin McCarthy, said Wednesday night that she, too, 
is a no on Scalise because he once spoke before KKK leader David Duke's European American Unity and Rights Organization. Scalise later apologized, saying he had no idea that was a white supremacist group because the man who ran for Congress calling himself David Duke without the baggage is a degenerate liar. Mace, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, brought up Scalise's blood cancer as another reason for voting for Jim, Ca- Jim Jordan. Jordan has already endorsed Scalise, but Mace says she's going to vote for him anyway. Isn't it against the law to say you're not going to vote or hire someone because of their health status? Isn't that? Oh, right, right, right. These are Republicans. There are no laws. Nobody knows when Scalise is going to go before the full house and take a vote for speaker. It's apparent, as I just said, that he does not have 217 votes. And it's also apparent he may never get it. In fact, high-level members of the Republican caucus speaking off the record say there's a 2% chance the Republicans, short of forming a coalition with Democrats, will ever elect a speaker. A 2% chance that the Republicans will ever elect a speaker. I suspect this is the far right's game right now. I suspect they're thinking, okay, okay, you got your continuing resolution to keep the government funded. You avoided what we wanted, a government shutdown until a 2024 budget was passed. So we're going to get what we want. We're going to get even with you by refusing to elect a speaker and thereby shutting down the government. But this time, everybody gets paid until November 17th, thanks to that continuing resolution. See, I think that's the game. I think that suits the Freedom Caucus just fine, that they don't have a speaker and we don't get a budget by November 17th. No budget means no spending. Now, I warned last month that we are entering uncharted territory in this post-January 6th landscape. There are a lot of Republicans right now pretending to be reasonable, pretending they want to elect a speaker. But dang it, I I just can't read the map. I, I want a speaker, but I can't find the path towards a speaker. They don't want a speaker. They want to shut down the entire legislative branch. They don't think Ukraine is an emergency. They don't think Israel is an emergency. And people like Chip Roy have hinted that shutting down the government is a good thing because it shows people how unnecessary government really is. So will we ever be treated to Steve Scalise sitting through 15 or 15,000 rounds of voting before he's elected speaker? I have no idea. Before casting their votes Wednesday morning, the Republican caucus in the House rejected a proposal, a proposed rule that would have prevented what they refer to as a doom loop of votes for speaker, the kind of doom loop we saw in January when it took 15 rounds for Kevin McCarthy to get elected. The rule would have demanded that they don't emerge with a nominee until they have all 217 votes. That is looking more and more unlikely because this is our post-January 6 political landscape. Nobody knows how this plays out because there are dishonest Republicans, more dishonest than ever. They're pretending they want to elect a speaker and get a budget passed, But what they secretly want is the paralysis and gridlock we're seeing right now in Washington. Some good did come out of this. Americans were were reminded of the sexual assault scandal looming over former wrestling coach Jim Jordan's head. If you remember Jim Jordan coached wrestling at Ohio State University before becoming the most duplicitous cat fighter the House has ever been subjected to. In the lead up to Wednesday morning's vote, 
four Ohio State University wrestlers who were coached by Jim Jordan went public to declare he is not qualified to become speaker. They, along with six other wrestlers, said they witnessed personally Jim Jordan ignoring reports that team doctor Richard Strauss was engaging in sexual misconduct with the boys when Jordan was their coach. Jordan's response when he was told about Dr. Strauss Strauss reportedly was, that Strauss, something to keep in mind in the lead up to the vote on Wednesday is that Jordan polled better with likely GOP voters around the country. That's because he's the loudest and more people knew who Jim Jordan was than Steve Scalise. But Steve Scalise is more powerful. He's a better cash cow. He makes it rain with the donors. He's the majority leader, and he doesn't have to run to a bank of microphones every time he sees one the way Jim Jordan does. Now, the polling was better nationwide for Jim Jordan, but the speaker is not elected by the American people. The speaker is elected by the members of Congress. The leader of the party with the most votes in the House usually gets to be speaker, much like in a parliamentary system, he would become a prime minister if this were a parliamentary system. The speaker's not as powerful as a prime minister, but he could be, and at times he or she is. It all depends. The point is the louder voice Jim Jordan lost in the crowded, silent room Something to keep in mind. Nobody in politics likes anyone who freelances, who makes it about themselves instead of the party. So Scalise is the official nominee of the party, but that's not good enough to get the party to vote in lockstep. Jim Jordan also had more public endorsements than Steve Scalise. Jim Jordan had Donald Trump on his side, while Scalise was quietly getting people to vote for him. Normally, a candidate for speaker can carve out deals to make reluctant allies bend to their will. It's very simple. In the past, it's been find out what someone wants and promise to give it to them. It could be campaign donations or sneaking something into an appropriation bill that benefits their district. The problem McCarthy and now Scalise are up against is there's nothing they can offer diehard MAGA Freedom Caucus wrecking balls. These these people, if you want to call them that, come from deep red districts. They don't need cash and they don't want pork in an appropriations bill because they don't need pork. They have secure seats and they give their constituents something more beneficial than pork something more powerful than water projects, airports, and freeways. They give them hatred, bigotry, guns, and a Bible wrapped in an American flag. There's nothing you can give Chip Roy to make him happy. He's coming back to Congress no matter what. So the way it looks is Scalise is supposedly moving up to become Speaker. That leaves an opening for majority leader, right? He's the majority leader right now, but he has been nominated by his party to become speaker. On Tuesday, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma announced he would launch a bid for Scalise's old job, not quite realizing Scalise is probably going to be doing his old job and maybe never his new one. Hearn said last week that he was going to run for speaker, but over the weekend changed his mind. Congressman Tom Emmer from Minnesota is a Republican, and he's the majority whip in the House. He is also said to have his eyes on Steve Scalise's majority leader position. Emmer, however, was the chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee during the 2022 midterms, where Republican candidates were his candidates performed abysmally. Yes, Democrats lost the House, because that usually happens two years after a president from the same party takes office. But we were all expecting a red wave which never materialized, and there are many reasons for that. 
if the Republicans want to blame someone besides Matt Gates for the mess they're in right now, they could easily point to Tom Emmer for only delivering an unworkable five-vote majority. That's all they have, is an unworkable five-vote majority. And yet, Tom Emmer is their whip, and he wants to become majority leader. Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik from upstate New York graduated from Harvard, where she drove around in a BMW given to her by her rich father. Stefanik is married to a gun lobbyist. This is the kind of person I really like. Stefanik replaced Liz Cheney as GOP conference chair because they fired her after she began looking into January 6th. So essentially, the GOP conference chair lady is sort of makes you the number three in the leadership position. Stefanik has expressed interest in becoming whip or majority leader, but, but warned on Tuesday that now is not the time to be campaigning for leadership positions. Now is the time to get Scalise elected speaker. Elise for Scalise. She should take that. Uh, Elise for Scalise. You, you can have that. And uh, I'm going to watch my tongue. Congressman Byron Donalds is a Republican from the crappy, odious, horrendous state of Florida. And he's a member of the Freedom Caucus, although he was willing to work with McCarthy on getting a continuing resolution passed. In fact, Donalds put his name to McCarthy's continuing resolution. It died, but Donalds put his name on it. He, too, has expressed interest in taking Scalise's place as majority leader if and when Scalise is ever elected speaker. This is going to be a long slog. On Tuesday night, during their candidate forum, behind closed doors with just Republican members of the House listening, both Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan admitted that if they are elected speaker, they wouldn't be able to get a budget finished by the November 17th deadline. They both admitted during a candidate's forum that neither one of them can get the 2024 budget done by November 17th when the continuing resolution runs out. Who knows? That might have been what a lot of people in that room wanted to hear. A lot of people don't want a budget passed by November 17th. We know that. This is the mop-up for October 11th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. Please subscribe to my channel. Please leave a comment to let me know if I made a mistake or if you have some information to share. Please go to my website and subscribe to my newsletter. This is the latest on our deadlocked Congress. Congressional sources now say it is unlikely that Schumer and whoever ends up speaker will be able to pair a Ukraine spending bill with a spending bill for Israel. We are now being told that if and when the Republicans do pick a speaker, Congress is more likely to pair a Ukrainian, a Ukraine spending bill with a border security bill where they spend an equal amount of money on both. President Biden proposed a $24 billion supplemental spending bill for Ukraine back in August. It's just been sitting there. Last month, Ukrainian President Zelensky met with members of Congress and told them that without American support, Russia will win, which is probably what a majority of Republicans were glad to hear. Right now, there are Republicans thinking, hmm, we don't elect a speaker. Putin wins. Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York, the Democratic Party's ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, said he doubts the House will pass a resolution expressing support for Israel until there's a permanent speaker. 400 members of Congress have signed on to the resolution. We're not talking about a spending bill, just a resolution saying we're with you, Israel. Cannot do that without a speaker. Congressman Shri Thanadar, he's a Democrat 
from Michigan announced he is quitting the Democratic Socialists of America, accusing it of promoting anti-Semitism at a rally over the weekend as members and speakers celebrated the deaths of Israeli citizens. Yesterday, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the 33-year-old Democrat from the Bronx, condemned the DSA but said she wasn't quitting, which I think is the smarter move. You stay and fight. Republican Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri, who on January 6 raised a fist in support of the January Sixers, and then one hour later ran like a little pussy from them and is now writing books about America's declining masculinity. Hawley said he thinks funding earmarked for Ukraine should be sent instead to Israel. President Biden told a group of Jewish leaders meeting in the White House that he's working on getting Hamas to release American hostages. Hmm. Okay. Republican Congressman Derek Van Orden continues to indicate he has anger issues during a congressional briefing on the situation in Israel. Provided by Biden staffers, Van Orden was considered out of Van Order when he began hurling the F word and screaming after Biden staffers insisted there was no evidence that Iran was behind these attacks. If you remember back in July, Orden, Van Orden was caught on tape in the rotunda calling Senate pages who were sitting on the floor, quote, pieces of and ordering them to get the F up. Rashida Tlaib is a Democratic congresswoman representing Michigan's 12th district. She's also the only Palestinian American serving in the House. Earlier in the week, fellow members of the squad threw her under the bus when she called Israel an apartheid state in her message for peace. On Wednesday, Congresswoman Tlaib, who you should donate to, especially if you're an American Jew. That's my opinion. She clarified her position. She said, I do not support the targeting and killing of civilians, whether in Israel or Palestine. The fact that some have suggested otherwise is offensive and rooted in bigoted assumptions about my faith and ethnicity. That's Rashida Tlaib. If you're an American Jew who wants the best for Israel... I believe you donate to this woman. Don't allow Israel to become a wedge issue that keeps us from fighting for Medicare for all, student debt forgiveness, and of course, peace in Gaza and Israel. There are American citizens trapped in Israel this morning. Some are being held hostage by Hamas. Others are Palestinian Americans, U.S. citizens visiting friends and relatives in Gaza. Those Palestinian Americans, U.S. citizens, are stuck in Gaza. Let me tell you a little secret about love and tolerance and why New York City is the greatest place in the world. In New York City, you learn to live with everybody. Everybody. That's why they stuck the United Nations here. America is at its best when we open our borders to the world And all of us are forced to throw away our preconceived notions about race, ethnicity, religion, or nationality. The Statue of Liberty, which sits in our harbor, is a beacon of hope, not just for refugees. It is a beacon of hope for people who are already living here. Without a steady flow of migrants, we become brittle in our thinking. The UN is here in Manhattan because the world works out its problems here in Manhattan first, on the subways, waiting in line to see the Mets, or picking up our children from the free universal daycare that our former mayor, Bill de Blasio, delivered on. I played you a clip of our current mayor, Eric Adams, who called the migrant crisis a problem that will destroy this city. He said, as the mayor of New York, he has never witnessed a problem this bad and sees no solution. This from a New York City mayor. All four of my grandparents got here because this country saw them 
as a gift. Also a source of cheap labor and smallpox. Probably they saw them mostly as that, but some saw my grandparents as a gift uh, and a source of cheap labor, smallpox, and most definitely head lice. I'm pretty sure they brought head lice to the New World. But a lot of people saw my four grandparents as a gift, at least two of them. Right now, Donald Trump is insisting Hamas's attack on Israel proves he was right about the Muslim ban because he's a moron. Hamas's attack on Israel proves walls don't work. Israel spent a billion dollars on the subterranean wall between Gaza and southern Israel. Hamas bulldozed right over it. They tunneled under it and on their motorized paragliders flew over it. There is no Maginot line. The French taught us that. Iron Dome won't knock out all the missiles from the sky, and telling migrants not to come to America won't work because any place is better than where they're fling. We are never going to stop the flow of migrants coming into this country, and the sooner Americans wake up and realize that's a good thing, the sooner we can kickstart our economy, open up our cities, especially New York, where offices have been 40% vacant since COVID. Migrants bring jobs. They come to the city. They buy food. They buy clothes. They pay rent. They work. They pay into Social Security. They go to restaurants and nightclubs and keep this city humming. Broadway is dying. The theater is dead. Nobody goes to the theater anymore. Movie theaters are empty. I walk down Madison Avenue and all the storefronts are boarded up. It's like an apocalyptic hellscape. Nobody's living here in New York City and nobody's buying anything. Migrants are not the problem, Mayor Adams. They are the solution. Because whatever you spend on housing, getting these people up on their feet, putting their children in our increasingly emptier public schools, whatever we spend on them comes back tenfold, a hundredfold. Learn Economics 101, the multiplier effect. You give one migrant a dollar, It hasn't even touched their fingers before it's spent on something to eat. And then that dollar is spent by the grocer to buy more milk. And that dollar, that same dollar that we gave the migrant, is now spent by the delivery truck who brings the milk so he can buy new tires and so forth and so on. That is the multiplier effect. It's economics 101. One dollar handed to a a migrant multiplies throughout our economy and ripples all the way up to Albany, our state capital, in the form of taxes. Every time that dollar changes hands, the city and the state skims off the the top in sales taxes or income taxes. So my mayor, who says migrants are destroying this city and he doesn't see a solution, From the core of my very being, Mayor Adams, go F yourself. My mayor telling migrants they're not welcome in New York City, go F yourself. That is one of the worst things ever to come out of the mouth of a mayor. And we had Rudy Giuliani telling migrants not to come to New York City. He went to Mexico and said, do not come to my city. Now, I don't know much. I was right about Scalise. I said, well, I I I didn't say, I predicted he would be the next speaker. Uh, So I'm wrong on that. But I did say he was going to beat Jordan. So sometimes I get things right. Mostly I get things wrong. But here's one thing I know for certain. There is only one thing that will kill New York City. AIDS couldn't kill it. COVID couldn't kill it. The Great Recession didn't kill it. The unaffordable housing we have now won't kill it. What will kill New York City is turning off the spigot of fresh blood. 
the migrants. Nobody's living here. Nobody comes here to work. Anyone who doesn't see these migrants as a godsend is an ignoramus and should rot in hell. Rot in hell. Anybody who doesn't see these migrants as a gift with all this empty land we have in America, all these empty storefronts, all these empty buildings, go F yourself, you racist ignoramus. Meanwhile, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio is a Democrat, and he is chairman of the banking committee. He says it's time to refreeze Iran's $6 billion that's being held right now in Qatar. I guess they haven't gotten their $6 billion yet. This is a Democrat, Senator Brown, promised to work with Republican Senator Tim Scott, the presidential candidate who serves on the banking committee. They're going to work together to launch an investigation into how exactly Hamas got the funding for their attack. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who also sits on the Senate Banking Committee next to Tim Scott and Brown, she suggested Wednesday that cryptocurrency is the primary financial tool for Hamas, as well as other terrorist organizations around the world. I guess they launched, the Republicans believe Hamas launched their terrorist attack on credit. They used a card, I guess, and... uh, So they got points. They got a lot of points on their credit card. What is $6 billion? Uh, The way it is with Delta now, I think $6 billion, if you spend $6 billion on your credit card, Delta gives you a coach trip from Newark to LaGuardia. That's the way the rewards programs have panned out here in America. Independent senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, warned on Wednesday that Israel's bombardment of Gaza violates international law. It's amazing that we have to be reminded of that. Bernie said, quote, the targeting of civilians is a war crime, no matter who does it. It's amazing that people have to be reminded that killing civilians still is a war crime. Jean-Luc Mélenchon... Melanchon? Jean-Luc Melanchon. Jean-Luc Mellencamp? Jean Cougar? Melanchon is the leader of France's far-left France Unbowed Party. Uh, Is it Jean Cougar Mellencamp? Is that his name? No, it's Jean-Luc Melanchon, I think. This is serious. Uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, John Cougar Mélenchon, is the leader of France's far left, France's, France Unbowed Party. Now, with attacks against Jews in Paris on the rise this week, Mélenchon refused to condemn Israel's assault on Gaza. He did urge restraint. He insisted violence only leads to more violence. But that wasn't good enough for Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne, whose father was dragged into a Nazi concentration camp. She called Melanchon's ambiguity revolting. France's far-right national rally, that party, accused Melanchon of supporting Islamist terrorism. All he said is killing on both sides is wrong, and he got it from everybody. Uh, Wow. Republican presidential candidate and intellectual lightweight Nikki Haley on Wednesday echoed the sentiment of Benjamin Netanyahu and called for, quote, the elimination of Hamas. Speaking of the massacres that took place on Israeli soil, the former U.N. ambassador said, quote, this is sick and we have to treat sick people the way they deserve to be treated and eliminate them, unquote. I believe that's also her official stance on health care policy here in the United States to eliminate sick people. This is a U.N. ambassador that Donald Trump appointed. And Senator Lindsey Graham went on Fox News Wednesday night. And when asked about Gaza, he replied, 
level the place. Amazing. These are senators, UN ambassadors. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky is a Democrat from Illinois, and she urges caution. She warned that shutting off all the electricity in Gaza, along with nonstop missile strikes, will put American hostages in danger. Really? Because Senator Lindsey Graham says, level the place. I mean, I was just trying to figure this out now. We have... American hostages, we have 150 hostages being held in Gaza. And Lindsey Graham says, level the place. That makes sense. Kill everybody, and that way the hostages uh, get released, right? Isn't that the way it works? And, and then this Democrat, Jan Schakowsky out of Illinois, says if you shut off the electricity and continue with nonstop missile bombardments, it endangers of the American hostages. Do American hostages, can they get killed by missile strikes? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Lindsey Graham uh, was a JAG officer in the Air Force. Wouldn't he know better? I don't think American hostages c can be killed by uh, missile strikes. I think only uh, Hamas can be killed by missile strikes. They're using smart missiles, right? They, they have missiles that can take the DNA of who they're attacking. I'm pretty sure that's what I read uh, or heard Joe Rogan say. I don't know. Jesus, I, I, what is going on here? That we're, where we have to remind people that bombing civilians is a war crime? What, what country is this? 100-year-old war criminal Henry Kissinger on a visit to Germany was asked on Tuesday to respond to a spontaneous pro-Hamas rally that broke out in Germany and was immediately shut down by the German government. Henry Kissinger, war criminal, 100 years old because neither God nor Satan wants him, Henry Kissinger, war criminal, who has a son David Kissinger, who trades off his name in television, he has a son who walks around Hollywood saying, I'm Henry Kissinger's son. Hire me. Uh, we're going to go with Pol Pot's daughter. We want a little more diversity here. Uh, Henry Kissinger said Germany let in way too many uh, immigrants. He said that's the problem. He said the, the, the anti Israeli pro-Hamas rally in Germany is because Germany let in way too many immigrants. Boy, Hank, you still got it. Dr. Hank, 100 years old, you haven't lost a step. You know, Germany let in way too many immigrants. That's what uh, the man whose family fled Germany and came to America when it wasn't letting in too many immigrants said. He got in. But he says, this is his quote, and I'm not going to impersonate him because the impersonation is too good. He said it was a grave mistake to let in so many. This is what he told the German people. They, if you remember when the war broke out in Syria, Germany welcomed the migrants from Syria. And Henry Kissinger, who was a migrant from Germany, right? came to America. He said it was a grave mistake for Germany to let in so many people of totally different culture and religion and concepts because it, it, because it creates a pressure group inside each country. That's what a war criminal believes. Wow. Wow. This is what people think. Donald Trump on Wednesday laid into Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and blamed Netanyahu for the massacres, massacres accusing him of not being prepared. Well, Trump got that right. Trump said if he were still president of America, they wouldn't have needed to be prepared. Israel would not have needed to be prepared because Trump 
would have solved the Palestinian crisis like he did during the first four years of his presidency, right? Like it was all solved. Uh, Then he accused Bibi Netanyahu of taking credit for Trump's 2020 killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. That was my kill, not yours. He He was upset that Bibi took credit for it. This is the latest. 1,200 Israelis have been killed, 169 of them Israeli soldiers. 3,000 Israelis have been wounded. 150 people are believed to have been kidnapped and now held hostage in Gaza. Gazan health officials now say 1,127 Palestinians are dead, 5,300 have been wounded, a majority of whom are not soldiers. This, as the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a statement saying, every Hamas member is a dead man. That is the kind of tough talk I'd expect from someone who completely blew it. That is when somebody really screws up the way Benjamin Netanyahu or George W. Bush did after 9-11 when he said, Osama bin Laden wanted dead or alive, or bring it on, you know, that that is the talk of somebody who really screwed up. Uh, There is concern this morning in Israel of it becoming a two-front war as minor skirmishes continue in northern Israel. Fighting continues to break out between Lebanon-based Hezbollah which is funded by Iran and Israeli soldiers. Hezbollah is a way more powerful foe than Hamas, and Hezbollah did serious damage to Israel in its 2006 war against Israel. The United Nations is reporting that 330,000 Gazans have lost their homes since the bombing began. Israel warns Gazans to leave, leave through Egyptian border crossings. But Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi warned Palestinians, if you leave and come into Egypt, you will be sent back to Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu formed an emergency government with opposition leader Benny Gantz on Tuesday. But Yair Lapid, who heads another opposition party in Israel, says he will refuse to join Netanyahu's government, accusing Netanyahu of making alliances with racists, which is true. Let's end on a lighter note. Carrie Lake launched her Arizona Senate campaign, which is strange because she, I think she's insists she's still the governor of Arizona. She says her issues are inflation, border security, and figuring out what to do with the rest of her life No, now that nobody will hire her as a TV anchor person. Donald Trump recorded a message supporting her. That's it. Not a good week. Not a good week. Not a good week. I'm amazed at what we have to remind people of. It's incredible. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Sorry for the late start. Uh, I try to do this at 12.05 a.m. Eastern, but uh, I was overwhelmed today, as everybody is. Please like this so it stays in your feed Please share it. Uh, Please comment. I need your comments. Uh, Somebody corrected me. Somebody said Rashida Tlaib was from Minnesota. No, I double checked. She's from Michigan. So I like to correct the people who correct me. Unless, Unless I'm wrong, I'm almost positive Rashida Tlaib is from Michigan and not Minnesota. Maybe she was... Maybe she lived in Minnesota. I don't know. What else do you need to do for me? Uh, Subscribe to this channel, please. Uh, 
Thank you to the moderators in the chat room. Thank you to the chat room. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. I'll try to be on time tomorrow. What do I have here? Oh, I was working on, I have a new hotel. The David Feldman Motel, Cozy Comfort. This is just some stuff I've been working on. David Feldman's, uh, these are a chain of hotels that I've been, uh, David Feldman's Cozy Motel, Cozy Comfort. All right. And, uh, Cruelty-free chicken. Uh, before they're slaughtered, we they sit in a hot tub. And uh, is that nice? Cruelty feet. And uh, that's a, a rooster and a hen. Uh, Valentine's Day special. And this is, uh, they're getting a massage right before getting slaughtered and uh, going for a swim. This is just some stuff I'm working on. Cruelty-free chicken. All right. Hang in there.